So we are excited to kick off our panel on the lunar economy. Joining me on the panel are Kevin O'Connell, former director of the Office of Space Commerce at the U.S. Department of Commerce and MIT Media Lab space affiliated researcher, and Blair DeWitt, CEO of Lunar Station Corp. Welcome to the panel. Uh, thanks for having us. All thanks right. for having us. Good to be here, Scott. Why don't we start with maybe just a little bit of background, uh, starting with you, Kevin. Thanks. So you you mentioned that I've been the previous director of the Office of Space Commerce and uh, got uh, almost four decades in the in the national security side of the business, but also uh, most of that time working on space commercialization issues and uh, very excited about the lunar economy, our topic today. Uh, I spent a lot of time on that while at Commerce. I spent a lot of time on that now today, uh, and I'm looking forward to our discussion about uh, some of the trends we're seeing in the space economy. Terrific. And how about you, Blair? Uh, yeah, we've been uh, actively thinking and pursuing a, uh, the lunar economy for six years uh, here at Lunar Station. Uh, we organized in 2016 on the campus at MIT and have continued to see uh, tremendous growth in this new economic zone. Great. Well, starting with the kind of a big picture is I think for let's say main, mainstream or, or lay persons that are not in the space industry itself, when they look at the moon as an example, uh, they think in terms of you know, sending astronauts back, maybe nostalgia from the Cold War era, uh, certainly science experiments, but beyond that, they're not really thinking at the full potential. So I wonder if both of you can comment around what sh how should we be looking at the lunar opportunity and what's the perspective that we need to have? So maybe I'll start, Scott. Uh, you know, in, in the projections of the one to three trillion dollar space economy that we see over the next two decades, uh, and it's actually moving faster than that right now. Uh, what we know is that the lunar economy, or what's sometimes called the cis lunar economy, uh, is actually considered to be roughly half of that figure. Uh, and you're right. When I talk with either the investment community or or just people that don't follow the space industry quite a bit. Uh, what I often find is they think the next thing that happens on the moon is the arrival of two astronauts, you know, him and her uh, mid-decade. Uh, in fact, what we see, and in the interest of time, I'll, I'll just summarize, what we really see is three important clusters of activities going forward. Uh, the first are the infrastructure people, the people that are going to provide the communications, the, the PNT, the navigation capability other infrastructure capabilities on the moon. The second, probably more prominent for most people are the landers and rovers. Uh, you know, we probably will consider 2022 the year of the lunar economy, the start of the lunar economy, because we probably will have one or two landers up there by the end of the year. Uh, and that's very, very exciting. And then lastly, probably something folks wouldn't think about, uh, people are starting to think about things that we do on Earth that might be better done on the moon. So there's been some press lately on the idea of putting data centers on the moon where you can actually take advantage of the very cold uh, surface of the moon or even some of the crater uh, coldness uh, on the moon to actually do that business in a much more efficient way. Uh, and so a lot of different activities headed to the moon. Over 70 missions are planned for the moon over the next decade, and hopefully they'll all succeed, obviously. Uh, but, uh, you know, the, the chances of many of them succeeding is quite good. So very excited about those prospects. Yeah, I concur. I think uh, when you look at uh, some of the latest uh, lunar market uh, assessments, uh, it continues to grow. And the assessments, I think, are very accurate in how the various sectors of the lunar economy are going to grow. Uh, we're... Uh, deeply uh, steeped in the lunar environmental data section of the market, uh, which has very healthy um, um, uh, projections. But more importantly, I think what's exciting about all these assessments is the fact that we're looking at establishing a supply chain, a very healthy, robust supply chain to and from the moon. Uh, and with that supply chain enabled and active, the lunar economy has um, a, a great opportunity to accelerate. Uh, and that acceleration will be in how we can uh, thrive on the surface of the moon, going after resources, uh, habitation, 
uh, transportation hubs. Uh, it's a great place to go farther into space uh, if you can catch a ride to the moon. So I think with the supply chain, all of those things uh, become viable. You know, one of the things that we talked about in an earlier session was around sustainability. Uh, mm -hmm. So we one session was around energy independence. Uh, another session was around food independence. And when I say independence, meaning that a domestic nation can actually provide its own and doesn't have to rely upon uh, other other uh, international trade partners or depend on uh, potential disruptions in the global supply aspects. Now, one of the things that's quite interesting is that when we think about even you know, renewable things, uh, solar, wind, but also uh, transition to electric vehicles, all of these transitions require new sources, new raw materials. Mm -hmm. And when we have to mine for lithium to various other raw and rare minerals, it has, uh, you know, externalities. Uh, so on the moon, there's an opportunity for us to, because you mentioned something quite interesting, is that we, we have an opportunity to do things on the moon that we can't do on Earth without necessarily having uh, negative consequences. The moon doesn't have the issue of the atmosphere and global warming. Uh, it, it just it's not relevant. So we can't afford to actually uh, look for uh, minerals, not necessarily to send back to Earth, but certainly use it for creation, production, and building uh, the, the the lunar cystic economy, but also to support the deeper space exploration. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about. Uh, what makes the moon so special and what are some things that we can do there that we can't do here, including a low gravity experimentation uh, from molecules to new forms of structures to new forms of modeling? Yeah, so uh, very important question because in some sense, and Blair's already alluded to it, uh, the moon could be considered a way station for deeper space exploration. Now, there's a key scientific question they'll have to be answered in the first wave of explora exploration that goes up there. And it's the quality of the water ice that's on the moon. Uh, because if the water ice is of sufficiently high quality, it can then be turned into fuel. And so you, you have only to have need enough fuel to get to the moon if you can then create more fuel to go further away. So that's a key scientific question. But, but as you say, the microgravity environment allows for certain opportunities. Uh, Scott, I think you and I talked about space medicine before. Uh, and there's at least one experiment which suggests that if you can get people into some level of suborbital uh, flight, that doctors can actually see different things, early indicators of disease that they might not see on Earth. Uh, we hear about the potential to grow food. There are major initiatives on food and space. The Japanese have a major initiative in this area, uh, you know, not, not to bring it back down to Earth, but to sustain life on the moon and then potentially use it to go farther. So there are a lot of opportunities for sustainability uh, on the moon that, that people are already thinking about. And frankly, investors are already investing in. Yeah, and I think um, with one sixth the gravity, uh, the opportunities to uh, collect resources, process them into finished goods, and then have them waiting and available is a critical part to this because not only will those um, uh, supplies be utilized on the moon, but they can actually be ferried back to low earth orbit uh, to help the low earth orbit economy uh, as a destination uh, for those going to private space stations or uh, to top up the tanks before you, you come all the way to the moon. So there's, there's a lot of capabilities there. Uh, and the other aspect of this is what's just under the surface of the moon. Uh, would you uh, have habitations in former lava tubes that provide great shielding, but also uh, afford uh, a quite uh, expanse? Uh, to, to uh, have uh, higher populations than two astronauts uh, roaming around. Could you start seeing villages? Uh, new New York City, <laughs> possibly. Yeah, actually, you're kind of uh, skipping ahead, and I kind of like that, uh, Blair, which is that when we think about the moon, we just see this as this massive land that's just kind of empty and barren. But yet, I think when we talk about the emerging market dynamics, what we're seeing is that the moon has a potential to become a new city, maybe even a new mega city. And with that, there's an opportunity to create all the new infrastructure, 
yes. utilities, energy, communication, logistics, supply chain, transportation. And that's really, that's really what the opportunity of the moon is about, isn't it? And when you said half of the space economy is attributed to cislunar, that's what we're talking about. So that in the future, uh, instead of vacationing, let's say in you know some places in, in South Pacific or the Caribbean, you can actually go to the moon and you can have a full resort, a six-star hotel, and all the amenities there, uh, and be able to experience low gravity and space like never before. Yeah, some of the early early concepts of of commercial space stations have uh, so, let's say significantly far more luxury uh, in anticipation of a space tourism market uh, for people to 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 participate in that. Yeah, and it could take you uh, a week to get to the moon. It could take you a couple of days. You know, there's there's no uh, speed limit uh, in how you get there. Uh, are you going to touch down or are you just going to cruise by and swing back? You know, those are the types of options uh, tourists will have. Um, and honestly, I, I I would love to play some golf on the moon. I, I, I actually <laughs> get it farther. <laughs> Then I could off a tee box here. <laughs> so, so, so Blair, uh, there are some really important questions that needs to be answered, which is, you know, whether it's landers, rovers, or maybe you're trying to set up uh, on ground uh, s- cellular telecommunication stations, or, or you're just trying to provide a, a satellite constellation, or the ability to make sure, you know, to uh, Kevin's point, you know, making sure you're getting the right quality deposits of lunar ice or, or, or minerals, all those questions are really oriented towards, you know, am I placing my asset in the right place? Am I looking in the right place? And are we going to find what we're expecting? All of this uh, really uh, begs a question of intelligence. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that and what you guys are doing to help um, address that. Yeah, um, absolutely. Uh, that's our, our core focus is providing intelligence to organizations that are uh, seriously planning uh, their lunar strategy. And, you know, these organizations like mining companies, you know, they spend a lot on um, uh, uh, exploration. Uh, because they're looking for those next strategic reserves for them to capture and convert into market goods. Well, uh, the moon has those stockpiles. Um, where they're located and what concentrations, those are those are questions we answer for our clients. Uh, how do they get there? Uh, you're not going to land right on it. So where is the best spot to kind of come in and then roll into it. Uh, Telerobotics is really going to see a lot of utilization on the moon. Uh, This is uh, an opportunity and a challenge at the same time, because when we do um, telerobotics here, there really isn't much delay uh, in the signal. Um, But when you're talking about the moon, uh, you, you cannot go faster than the speed of light. So there's a significant lag from a systems perspective. So how do you minimize that lag and what kind of um, uh, capabilities do you need to have in the neighborhood versus running everything from Earth? So these challenges will create new technologies. Uh, our part is to make sure that the data that has already come from the moon is being understood better uh, in a new ways. And with all the new data that's going to be generated via private uh, missions or government agency missions, that that gets uh, um, uh, worked and available to uh, the global uh, uh, commercial uh, audience. Well, it's uh, and it's very exciting, and I think uh, there's just more things that we need to identify and learn about than anything else. And there's so much infrastructure that's needed. And the the point about tele robotics is really interesting because we know that the first, really, the first decade, a lot of the work, the underlying ground building up of the infrastructure on the moon isn't going to be done by astronauts. It has to be done by swarm of robotics, some autonomous, but really most of them being uh, remote control from Earth. Uh, so the ability to actually address some of the lag issues, be able to address some of the coordination between the robots to do the work is going to be hypercritical to the development of the lunar economy and the systems. Um, can you talk about a lunar station 
uh, because you guys have been in this space for a long time, you've seen where things are. And I, I, I kind of, you know, compared to the sustainability movement where let's say five years ago, climate action wasn't quite where it is today, but now the, the, the just the, you know, it's at a crescendo in terms of, you know, we need to do something. And this is coming from the Department of Homeland Securities, <laughs> you know? So what are you seeing that you feel like is we're beyond the tipping point where this isn't just some pipe dream and, and science fiction, but this is reality? Yeah, you know, there's always those hidden leading indicators that give you a good read. And for us, I think what what uh, we're we're really enjoying is the fact that um, we're seeing acceleration in agreements. Uh, six years ago, it, it, it took a lot longer to actually move through the agreement uh, phase and get to work. Now, uh, it, it, it's uh, very quickly uh, moving through those paces and we're getting uh, engaged quicker. So I, I think that's a, that's a hidden uh, leading indicator that it is moving forward very quickly. Uh, organizations, not just here in the US, but in Canada, Australia, Japan, Europe, uh, Middle East, you know, these are uh, all starting uh, to kick in. And so it's not just one government agency with one mission, one flag. It is a uh, global commercial endeavor. Uh, and I think that's what's really fascinating. And uh, the fact that you can buy a lander and have your mission, you can buy rovers and you don't have to build everything yourself. There's, uh, you know, communication networks and positioning networks that are getting set up. So you just like a AT&T or Verizon uh, subscription. So all of these different components are simultaneously getting uh, established and put in place so that uh, a non-traditional uh, company uh, with interest in the moon can actually just go and organize a mission without having to have uh, 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 forest that the aerospace schools and NASA for employees. Mm -hmm. you, know, you can go to market and organize a mission. That, and Kevin, I'm, I'm sure you see this because you're all over the world. So, so you know, I make just two quick points on this uh, to, to emphasize the point that Blair's making. You know, we're seeing a new wave of innovation coming from companies that traditionally have not been involved in space in any way. You know, the first wave of innovation came from either space people talking to space people or folks talking to others that had a background in space. We've moved beyond that at this point, and folks are using the accessibility of space uh, to really try to experiment and innovate in different areas. And that's a much broader trend in the space economy that we see. The second, uh, to the point about the data. Uh, there'll be a strategic imperative as well that the person who gets, you know, the country who gets to the moon first and is able to credibly document, you know, the data, the detailed data, what, what Blair likes to call the data tsunami uh, that, that he's ready to, 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 you know, take on from both a supply and demand perspective. Um, I think that's a critically important point from a strategic perspective. That'll be another aspect of the business going forward. Now, Kevin, I want to broaden the, the, the conversation a little bit to just the broader space economy uh, from a policy perspective. Uh, and when I say policy perspective, I'm thinking about the space force, but also national security. Uh, sure, we sure. know there's a lot of activities uh, that the China is doing, for instance. And then, of course, with the Russia-Ukraine war, we've been very much uh, you know, tactically affected uh, in terms of our reliance upon the rockets, for example. So, how, how should we be looking at the overall space opportunity as well as, uh, you know, potential intersection to intelligence as well as national policy? Well, so both, uh, both the strategic aspects of space are growing as well as the space economy. Uh, and the key is making sure that there's, there's proper lines of, of uh, responsibility between the two. Uh, as we prosecute them. Obviously, I'm, I'm about to go speak in about uh, 20 minutes. I'm about to speak on a big panel here called the future of, of space business. And we have to think about the nexus of space and economics as an aspect of security, uh, in addition to all the exciting things that we've been talking about. Uh, as a matter of policy, if you follow U.S. policy, uh, it is much more continuity than change over the last five administrations. You know, there are changes at the margin. Uh, I think the thing we were able to do in the last administration in particular 
was to reflect the growing importance of commercial activities in space. Uh, for those that don't know it, commercial activities today represent about 80% of all activities that are underway in space. Uh, and so we do have to adjust our thinking and our policies to, to encourage that and to get the right relationships between governments and, and, uh, and commercial activities. You know, I think, I think that's uh, really exciting. Uh, you know, I think if we look back at um, the genesis of SpaceX, uh, it, we started to see the privatization of space shuttles, really. Uh, then we're starting to see privatization of satellites, and we're starting to see privatization of space stations, and of course, the privatization of the activities on cislunar as well. This is really powerful and very important because, uh, you know, when we think about some of the things that has happened, not only in, the, in terms of the U.S., but the history of the world, whenever things have gone from kind of governmental public sector to private, there's a really a lot of transfer of not only power, but also potential economic wealth. And Absolutely. I wonder, Blair and Kevin, if you could talk about, you know, is this going to potentially, you know, create not just the next billionaires, but trillionaires? And is that why Jeff Bezos... Uh, Elon Musk and Richard Branson are pouring billions into the space economy. Absolutely. Uh, when you uh, look at uh, the amount of assets on the moon, uh, raw, but the assets that are there, uh, there's a tremendous amount of wealth available to be obtained. And um, I say obtained specifically because you can't look through a telescope and go, ah, that's mine. <laughs> you have to go and get it. And the motivation in going to get it is that uh, it's not contested and you don't have um, uh, anything really stopping you from obtaining it. Uh, there needs to be some orchestration. Uh, I think uh, as far as government agencies are concerned, their primary role is going to be making sure that the pathway to the moon stays open and available. The spot in cis lunar space where you're transferring really from Earth's gravity to the moon's gravity is a critical junction. It's almost like the Suez Canal or the Panama Canal. It needs to be uh, uh, internationally commercially available uh, with no impediments. And so you'll see governments really trying to manage more that aspect, uh, not really um, worried too much about the terrain other than, you know, you don't want people uh, uh, stacking on top of each other in particular locations, but that supply chain is, is going to go through a very specific point in space and that needs to be watched and monitored. I don't, uh, Kevin, that's probably going to be something you guys are going to be talking about. Uh, is that oh, I, I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to actually bring it back down to earth. So I, so I certainly <laughs> agree with Scott's premise, but I, but I would call people's attention to the fact that, uh, you know, we use space so many times a day. We're using mm -hmm. it right now on this call, I'm sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and COVID actually called into sharp relief, the past investments in space that we were able to leverage quickly uh, to help mitigate the effects of the pandemic. And so one of the benefits I see, and, and having been at Commerce, you know, I got to talk with a lot of countries around the world, uh, and their, their ministries were interested in the economic growth and the talent development and the innovation aspects that they can bring back to their populations here on Earth. And so not only will there be, as Blair says, there'll, there'll be wealth creation by virtue of what people are doing literally in space, uh, but there are all going to be all sorts of paybacks, if you will, in, in the economy on the ground here on Earth. Uh, again, we spoke before about space medicine, and uh, people often uh, kid me and say, you know, what do you, you got a dozen doctors that care about this, Kevin? And the reality is there's 70 organizations worldwide focused on space medicines, very high quality ones. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, what that implies is that we're going to learn a lot about how to get our, our, our bodies to Mars safely. Yeah. But it also means we're going to learn a heck of a lot more about how to take care of ourselves here on Earth. And Absolutely. we'll see paybacks back back to wealth creation here on earth based on that. Yeah. And just to echo that point is that, you know, part of the reason we, we focus on longevity within biotech is because we see that the things that we can learn around longevity in space has direct impact in terms Absolutely. of what we can apply on earth as well. Now for the remaining uh, time that we have, uh, Blair, I wanted to see if you could go a little bit more granular in terms of your solution. What exactly are you guys doing? 
give us some maybe some case studies, uh, some specifics around the technology, and the kinds of things that both from an ingesting of data, but also the kind of uh, manifestation or the or the data visualization that you're able to provide that gives the intelligence to ultimately give customers, private companies, the confidence to uh, move forward with their projects. Yeah, definitely. Um, you know, we created a platform called Moon Hacker, um, and Moon Hacker uh, takes the best of cloud processing uh, and software as a service and makes that available for clients. So clients really don't have any um, uh, problems with getting a server, loading software, none of that. You just connect to the internet, log in, and that also gives us portability. Uh, when they come in, uh, they have a couple of different options. They could look at result sets that they had asked for of the system. They can queue up new uh, queries as to what are uh, ideal locations that meet certain criteria? Uh, what are the environmentals going to be like? Because um, there really is no dark side to the moon. There's near side and far side, but uh, the moon has a day night cycle. Uh, it's uh, a longer cycle, but you need to know where your first uh, ray of sun is going to come and where the last is going to be so that you can continue to, to draw power from the sun. Um, and are you going to be able to see Earth from where you're operating or will you need relays? Those types of understandings are really important for these uh, operations to move forward. And uh, one of the things uh, that we've innovated on was the fact that uh, it's okay to look top down at a map, but we don't interact with the world that way. And so we create uh, synthetic simulated 3D terrains for people so that they inherently can understand what they're going to experience in, in areas of interest to them. Uh, and I think that makes it a little easier for a decision maker to make better decisions. Uh, instead of misinterpreting a two-dimensional map, let's put you on the surface and you can really see with information overlays how it's gonna go. And then you can really get back to the job you wanna be doing uh, because we've given you the information and the intelligence you need to move forward. You know, There's a lot of work that needs to be done if you're building landers or if you're building excavators. Why? waste time looking at raw data trying to figure out, well, wait, if I flip this pixel to that, you know, am I seeing, no. You know, just come into Moon Hacker, we'll tell you exactly quantitatively uh, what you're looking at and then visualize it uh, synthetically. Now, one of the defensibility or uh, let's call it even a, a almost a IP in a way is that uh, you have these ex the data exclusivity from the supply as well as the demand side. And I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, well, you know, we we're just talking about like, so uh, there's a lot of effort to build these remote sensing platforms. Uh, you know, it's really easy today to take an iPhone and, and, and basically take that technology and send it uh, to space. Not like it used to be where you needed a school bus and you know, a heavy lift rocket. Well, the fact that the remote sensing devices are getting smaller and more sophisticated means you can pack more on. Uh, the data itself is getting denser. That just to get the sensors there is a lot of work. A lot of these groups are overtasked with how do I take that to market? And we, uh, we alleviate that burden for them because all they need to do is uh, send the data to us, we'll process it, we'll integrate it into all our other analytics and then make it available to the market. So they're actually uh, really enjoying that because at the end of the day, they really want to build the best remote sensors there is. We take care of the data that comes from that. Super. All right, we only have one minute left. Um, where are you in terms of your next financing milestone and um, what's, what's the progress so far? Right. Uh, because we're seeing acceleration in the agreements, uh, what we want to do is uh, go ahead and have another round of financing. We did an initial round. Uh, we're a C Corp. So uh, our first round really helped us get started. Uh, but we want to stay ahead of the curve as far as uh, global customer demand, be it uh, private enterprise, government agencies, academia. 
So this round is actually going to help us uh, uh, accelerate with the global market and stay ahead. Super. Uh, with that, I want to thank Kevin and Blair for a terrific conversation on the lunar economy. Please give them a round of applause. Well, we continue our space track with our next panel on private space commercialization. Thank you, Thanks. Scott. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Nice to be here with you today. Bye-bye now. Thank you.